Right, so I'm going to introduce our speakers for this event. Um, first of all, we have chairing the event, and she stepped in at a rather late notice, which I'm, I'm so pleased that Izzy was able to do this, is Izzy Lawrence. Um, she's a history presenter for Netflix, Radio 4, UK TV yesterday. She hosts a number of factual podcasts for the British Museum, BBC Sounds, and her own popular science podcast about dinosaurs called Terrible Lizards. She's the author of historical fiction for children with books um, covering jujitsu. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to. Jujitsu, um, suffragettes, <laughs> female Spitfire pilots, and the true lives of pirates and the transatlantic slave trade um, in the upcoming no novel, Blackbeard's Treasure, due to be published by Bloomsbury Education this autumn. I was about to read out your number, but I won't do that. Um, <laughs> and joining Izzy is Dr. Emma Wells. Um, Emma is an award-winning historian, author, and broadcaster. She's lecturer in ecclesiastical and architectural history at the University of York, a regular contributor to television and radio, and writes for publications including BBC Countryfile, TLS, BBC History, and History Today. And she's the author of Heaven on Earth, the Lives and Legacies of the World's Greatest Cathedrals, which is out on the 7th of July, so please check that out in July, um, and also Pilgrim Roots of the British Isles. And finally, last but not least, is a HistFest regular who's usually here um, <laughs> rather than there, and it's Shafi Musadiq, who is a freelance journalist covering politics and culture with a focus on faith, frontier com communities, and minority communities in Britain. Shafi has reported for a range of publications in the UK and Europe, including the BBC, NBC, and The Economist. His interests include Islamic influences in Europe and shared interfaith connections. Over to you guys. Amazing. And well done to Rebecca as well for organising everything and doing amazing. So absolutely fantastic. It is the last event. What better subject than hell? It's where most of us will be ending up, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> well, I thought I literally got dropped into this at the last minute. So I'm absolutely fascinated by the subject. I've done a bit of you know, research and over the weekend just rereading all of the old books that were on my shelves. But what I thought would be the most open question I think we can start with is... What purpose does hell serve for religion in general? Because it's across several, you know, different religions, not just the Abrahamic ones. So, Emma, why don't you go first? Well, very simply, hell is hell because God is God. <laughs> Easy, we can go home. That's there we go, that's it, <laughs> the end. Um, no, we have a hell because we also have, we need to show the holiness of God. So, it's a very interesting, of course, it's a very interesting concept, mm. but it seems to stem from the idea that not that we will go to some far off or underground place, but that our actions, our deeds, our behavior will lead to ultimately going somewhere. And this stems from the idea of the sort of immortal, eternal soul, when it comes to Christianity at least, and therefore it's a natural end. There has to be some sort of fitting end. And that's why we have hell. We have to be in God's light. If we're not, we're in the darkness. Okay, well, what do you say, Safi? What's your theories. Islam is sort of like an updated yeah. version of, of Emma's hell. It's a bit better, isn't it? It's, bit yeah, it's like iPhone 10 to iPhone 9. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Right, right, okay. <laughs> um, so there's so many crossovers, um, as there is in all Abrahamic faiths. Um, with Islam, what's interesting is uh, in the Quran itself, there's, there's mentions of hell, but it's not very descriptive. So the purpose isn't necessarily laid out, but we know its purpose because whenever hell is mentioned, as soon as it's mentioned, paradise is mentioned. So mm -hmm. there's like, there's hell, but you know what? There's heaven, so it's gonna be all right. So we're not all damned, it's fine, <laughs> but just remember there's, there, there, there's something out there that you might fall into. So it's almost like a symmetrical balancing act. We need act. the equilibrium. You need equilibrium. both, and that is a, a sign of God's infinite mercy. Yeah. Um, as same in Christianity, but also um, the scope of human emotions as well, uh, because as much as it's godly, it, they, it evokes very human emotions, hell. So... Um, fear. Fear, yeah, yeah. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, 7th century Arabia, you've got, you know, even further back in the Middle East, people, the access to education isn't there. So how do you get... How do you get essentially what we're doing, lectures, but 
in a in a way that's for the masses, and this is it. So, so, so is the necessary part of hell that not everybody can go to heaven? Otherwise, what's the point of having a a, a virtuous life and this existence? Is, this is where it gets interesting because, for Christianity at least, uh, there is a debate over whether there is a predestined plan, mm. and this is God's predestined plan that you will go to. Oh, you not you personally, but this you will go. It might be predestined, but then it becomes a problem because mm. then we get to the last judgment. We have, you know, the book of um, Revelation, etc. We have the last judgment, the day of judgment, where our souls and the sins that we have committed during our lifetime are weighed. Do you go to the good space? Do you go into the bad place? But if it's already predetermined, does it matter what actions we have undertaken during our earthly lifetime? So is during the last judgment, you have Christ there and, he, and you have St. Michael weighing the souls and Christ is there. But is he just the intercessor of God's predetermined plan? Sounds very ancient Egyptian, Matt. That sounds, you know, the it's weighing it, yeah. of the yeah. heart. Yeah, yeah that's where it stems from. Crocodile eating your heart if it weighs more than a feather, which I think is deeply unfair. <laughs> I mean, how big is that feather? Um, it's huge. But that, that's, so, so hell is there basically in order to sort of do the full stop to your existence. This is final judgment, boom, there you go, end of the book, the end. But it's, it is a forever infinite thing. Yes and no. Yes and no, that's good. <laughs> the, problem, the problem with all this is there isn't really a concept as in a place. We're talking about hell as a place. We mm. think of this fiery underground pit, this you know, fiery torment where there's a devil eating our souls, you know, munching on our heads. Or souls of heads, I presume. That doesn't really exist. In the Old Testament, and you will have cross over here, we tend to get Sheol, which is, uh, you know, the sort of afterworld, un undering, underworld. I've heard realm. translations that they translate it as literally a graveyard. It's like a tomb. Sort of, yeah, yeah. And from that, you get the obviously the ancient Greek, uh, Greeks and the concept of Hades, which is similar. It's 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 a place for. Earthly um, souls to linger about. Mm. It's not until the New Testament that you get Gehenna, and that is an actual place. Well, it was an actual place on the outskirts of Jerusalem. It was seen as a essentially a rubbish dump that was supposedly eternally on fire, and therefore that became what we would associate with a sort of burning, um, this burning world, and the sort of metaphor for purification. So it's not really until arguably, the New Testament, that we get this fiery burning underworld. And that's literally based on a rubbish dump. Yeah. So so hell is a rubbish dump outside of Jerusalem. You heard it here first. Don't. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't have found that about. But, uh, that, Breaks that's, all sort of health and safety codes. Well, it's, yeah. Oh, gosh. Could you but it's interesting. Yeah, that, that explains. It is a very unpleasant place. And if yeah. you're trying to say, because presume we're talking about Jesus' New Testament and he's preaching yeah. about, you know, the... Well, he doesn't preach about heaven so much as um, the kingdom of God and its coming. Yeah. And the kingdom of God, he might have thought was an actual place which would come after the apocalypse, which he also saw as in his lifetime. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we have this in the book of Daniel, but I mean, this is the problem because he, Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven. Mm. And, you know, this idea of a place, it being a place, well, where does Jesus go when he descends from the cross? He goes to, you know, the, the realm of the dead. This is, it's known as the harrowing of hell. Mm. So if there isn't a concept of an actual space, which is hell, where did Jesus go? Where did Jesus go? That's quite... Still look at the answer. What about in Islam? Is there an actual place where hell is located? <laughs> it, there is, interestingly, so uh, the word in Arabic is Jahannam, and it's related to the yeah. Hebrew. Um, the Islamic progression is really interesting because it picks up the Jewish... Uh, location of Jerusalem mm -hmm. uh, right at the beginning and as the as the kind of scholarship uh, evolves into kind of the fifth by the time you get to the 16th century hell is an extraterrestrial place um, so there is a progression from it being on the earth and some scholars say it's not just in Jerusalem there's a sulfuric kind of acidic well in Yemen oh, nice. apparently okay. um, we should go find it there's a, a place in Afghanistan, a gorge, that was also located as the gateway to hell. Um, interesting places to, to call hell now. There's a now. place in England as well. A place in England, oh yeah. no, I believe hell that. The Hellfire Caves. 
Okay, where are the Hellfire Caves? Uh, people will know this. Where are the Hellfire Caves? Where, where are, does anybody... High Wycombe. There we go. High Wycombe. Uh, okay. We just have to go to High Wycombe. Yeah. Get that's, gun train to hell. That's on the M40. <laughs> 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 we take a day trip. Yeah. Well, that's... So, how are these places depicted, though? Because by the time... I mean, obviously, when Christianity starts, they have... Uh, uh, we have an actual location outside of Jerusalem and also when Islam starts, we have an actual... Okay, how are these depicted through art? Because this is your thing, Emma. This uh, is... Okay. I, I don't know. We've got a clicker and, oh, goodness, oh. that's a very sexy Satan. <laughs> <laughs> that's why Lovely. Rebecca chose it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but there we go, yes. There's, there's say, no guarantee he will look like this. If you look at Dante's Satan, a bit more bone crunchy, three faces, not as good. Um, but that's a very good one. <laughs> so we, we should really use the clicker, I imagine, and try and find some pictures sure. here. Oh look, okay. we can there we start go. Yeah. there with some Persian hell. Do you want to go to Do you want to go to Persian hell? Well, this is yeah, go to Persian hell because this is Ottoman. Okay, so okay. this is a picture of uh, the Prophet Muhammad's night journey, and this is where actually the the Islamic descriptions of hell come from. Um, so the Prophet Muhammad is in the middle. You can't see his face. That's the orthodox uh, kind of version of Muhammad. Um, out so of respect. He's the green, the fire. He's the green fire. fire, Muhammad. Um, and then behind him are all the biblical prophets, Abraham, Jesus, Aaron, etc. They're all behind him. But what's interesting, you can see in the corner, that's not the devil, that's dragons. Mm. Nowhere in the Quran there are dragons involved at all. Um, nor in the prophetic traditions, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, they're not there either. There's no embellishment of hell. But this is in the 16th century. So what we're seeing here are ideas taken from China via Persia about, you know, myth mythological creatures, really. This text is, a, is not religious. Mm. This is a secular political text. And uh, this is actually created within the Ottoman Empire. Um, essentially, it's a polemic, it's propaganda against mm. the Safavid dynasty. Essentially what it is, it's a similar thing was happening in Europe between Catholics and Protestants. Mm, yeah. And they're saying the Safavids are basically the dragons. Yeah. Um, so this, the images in Islam, aren't, there aren't many mm. uh, compared to Emma. Emma will have loads of images. But very similar to this. And, th and that's where the crossover has happened. Mm. Um, I think we have another image, the second one, Hello. possibly. Okay. So this is oh. the devil appears, finally, <laughs> uh, with He's the horns. But this is late, this is in the 16th century now, and this is the first time it appears in any sort of Islamic text. Um, so it's quite late on, and this is a sign, actually, again, Ottoman Empire, 16th century. This is more of a sign of the interfaith communities in the Ottoman Empire, yeah. these large Christian populations. Mm -hmm more or less this type of devil would have come from those Christian texts, not Islamic texts. So again, this represents more what's happening on earth, mm, you know, yeah. the mixing of people rather than any theological ideas about the devil. Mm. It was an amazing thing about the Ottomans and also uh, the Mughal Empire, which was starting about around the same time, sort of 1530s yeah. sort of time, is that they were really good at incorporating other faiths into their empire building. And they, you know, yeah. it was actually done out of respect in a way. You yeah. know, they, 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 they work together. The scholars will work together. So yeah, this is an example of that. Mm. I'm, just, I'm just having a look. So I, want to, I made a note about snakes. And that's, again, <laughs> it's Egyptian again. It, you get in, in Egypt, you also you get go. bitten um, by snakes. And I think there's, what is it, Nitog in, um, in the Norse mythology that, you know, we'll you go, go back to Genesis. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, origin of Genesis. Yeah. Well. But you actually go to hell and get bitten by stuff, yeah. which is quite cool. So, you know, I mean, it's really bad, guys, it's really bad. But, you know, sn snakes as a metaphor um, through everything is really quite interesting. Here we go, here's yeah. some Christian stuff. <laughs> but th so this is the first time we get the idea of what we usually think of as Satan and the devil with the cloven hooves. And he sort of stems from the pagan idea, the pagan god of Pan. And it's mixed with, and we'll see it on the next slide in a minute, the, the concept which we were just looking at, uh, this idea of a, a dragon or a serpent or a sea creature, a sea whale, um, of he the hell mouth as well. So they kind of go hand in hand and they derive from the sort of early English, Anglo-Saxon era. Um, that's the first time though that we really see an idea, a concept of hell being a sort of place with I was going to say an overlord, but he isn't really an overlord. 
the problem we get with Satan is as complex as, as um, hell itself because Satan becomes, at first, he's the adversary to God. Mm. We don't see him until much, much later into the Middle Ages become his sort of this rival, this nemesis. He is a fallen angel at the beginning. You know, he was one of God's beings, one of, one of God's angels, and decided he was going to overthrow God, as we all do. And therefore, God ex exiled him. He didn't put him in any sort of place. But it's this sort of idea mixed with a sort of early English um, ar artistic representations that were going on anyway. And we get this from the pagan god. Has he got, I mean, he's, he's, he's a bit nudie rudy so be careful, you don't look too closely. But he <laughs> seems to have three faces, four faces, I think, yeah. on that. So. Which is interesting, because we don't usually get this till quite, well, around this time, so later Middle Ages. Early Middle Ages, we get very sort of, I would say, rather simplistic ideas of Satan and hell. It's not until probably post 14th century, once we have the Black Death, we have crisis, mm. we have war, we have famine, we have the birth of the printing press, and therefore the spread of ideas and fear mongering. And that's when we really see the concept of hell and the devil ramp up, hence witchcraft, etc. Amazing. Let's, let's have a look at another one. Oh, sorry. And that's a perfect segue into this, which is we can see women associated. It's all our fault. With Satan. Sorry, <laughs> guys. Women go hand in hand with the devil. Yes. So uh, is that, I mean, is that a, a thing in, in Islam as well? Is it seen that women are, because it, it does tend to be that we are the ones who are very, very into, we get tempted by sin all the time. Of course we do. We're just really weak when it comes to that. And then is we take it? men in. I it. saw you stuffing your face around the corner. Of course, yeah. Oh, it's really bad. Um, During Ramadan as well, very bad. <laughs> bad. Um, yes and no. So in, in Islam, uh, there is no, in the Bible, I think it's Eve who's tempted by the fruit, yep. right? Um, in Islam, there's no mention of that. It's, we don't know. Uh, it might have been Adam. Um, I guess culturally, the, the thing is that cultures intermix and as Islam solidifies itself, it probably borrows a lot from the Christian mm -hmm. ideas. Um, what's interesting, th there are mentions of who will go to hell in Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, so one Once of them- any points at me. <laughs> Not point to get you. <laughs> One of them is uh, people who devour the wealth of orphans. Mm. Uh, it's very specific because the, the Prophet Muhammad himself was an orphan. Um, he loses his parents by the time he's seven, which is the start of his spiritual journey. So there is, that's quite distinct. Um, people who devour interest, usury, um, I think that's quite similar in Christianity as mm. well. Um, that. It's quite, um, it's very similar to Christianity, but there are certain specifics depending on who we're talking to. So just going back to the, uh, the night journey image that we showed, um, they, the images of, if you want to go back one more, more? that's the one. That's, that's, the one. So, that's the night journey. Essentially what the night journey is, is an episode in the Prophet Muhammad's life where, um, it's just after his first wife dies, and he goes on, some people say it's physical, but a lot of like esoteric uh, commentary say it was more mental uh, journey, where he travels up with the angel Gabriel, and he goes up through each layer of paradise, and he meets each biblical prophet. So he meets Aaron, he says, hey, he, he sees <laughs> Moses, and he says, hey, he says, Jesus, says, hey, how you doing? And um, What's really interesting is the ideas of hell come from this specific episode, because uh, when as he's on his way to meet God, when he gets to the fifth layer of heaven, so there's sorry, there's layers. Mm. We've got to mention there's layers. There's layers in a lot of them. Yeah. This is this is well, sort of. And you also <laughs> I don't know. More so the sort of grouping as we go on the grouping of um, sins and the punishment yeah. befitting of the sin into sort of groups. We don't really see layers until Giotto, layers. who's who influences Dante. See, that's arguably. interesting because in Islam there's layers. Uh, Which of, could be a Chinese influence as well. Because yeah. Because I think Diu has like. 18 different levels and like a yeah. hundred and something rooms and each room's got its own yeah. little like yeah, yeah. it's got a room full of tongue ripping which is the, the, one of the worst ones to end up in but this but, is such a great point yeah. because there's a version for in the 15th century scholarly versions not from the quran or the uh, prophetic sayings where 
Muhammad finds hell on the third layer as he's on his way to heaven, uh, sorry, not the third, the fifth, the interpretation of why he sees hell on the way to paradise, on the fifth layer of paradise, is that that represents Mars, the god of war. Oh. So by the time we get to the 15th, 16th century, a lot of Islamic scholars have absorbed the ancient texts of the Romans and the Greeks. Oh. So it's, it's, it's not about theology. No. Not at all. It's about... Culture. Culture. Well, yeah, it's all apocryphal. None of this is really biblical doctrine. This I mean, is, the, con yeah. the concept of hell doesn't really come into doctrine, uh, into yeah, biblical doctrine until, Paul? well, we have the fourth century, the Vulgate, you know, the Latin Bible, but really, doctrine, officially, fifth century. Fifth century? Yeah. That's when we get hell. But technically. 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 Okay. Yeah. Everybody before then was all right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with yes. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I'm just going to click through these as well. Because we, I mean, we talked a bit about, you know, witches and women, you know, and the idea of magic. But presumably this is about Christians trying to overcome paganism and old pagan traditions. Or is this because this is later, though? Yeah. And this is but this is what's interesting. We see this sort of shift around what well, the later Middle Ages, so 14th century, because of Obviously, the, as I say, the Black Death crisis, Protestantism is emerging. Mm. So there is this concept of fear and wrongdoing and what could be. And it's the first time you really see the concept of Satan as a person on earth who's getting women to do his bidding, to do his bad works. Mm. And that's where we get the concept of women. Well, it's not where we get, but it's particularly rife, women being the sort of subordinate the subordinate sex, and we see counterparts, um, hell and heaven, male and female, obviously male being heavenly bodies, of course, <laughs> and women much. being rather hellish. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the driver behind witchcraft, but that goes way back to, to Genesis, uh, and obviously Eve tempting, and even to Lilith, who was Adam's first wife, and it's a pretty much a similar story, she tempts him, and from This there is Dead Sea Scroll stuff, isn't it? Is well, that what we're talking about? <laughs> Sort of. <laughs> I don't know much about early theology. You have to forgive me. I'm asking. I'm asking questions which will allow our wonderful <laughs> audience to ask. Me. Seriously, you can ask very dumb questions because you That's guys fine. know more than I do. I swear. So. Well, so. Lilith was Lilith sort of tempts Adam, and she's his first wife mm. like after e whatever Eve was is classed as. Um, but she's a sort of angelic, ethereal, winged. A, yeah, angel, I suppose mm. she is, but she's a bit of a succubus. So that too, again, and what becomes really interesting is as we go um, into Christianity, into the Middle Ages, we get this um, sort of connection between women and being the sinister sex. Mm. Now, the Latin sinister is left-handed or left-sided, and therefore we get a very interesting, the left side will come onto a doom painting, I think, um, the left side of Christ. Here we, go. Here we go. Perfect. The left side of Christ will be the virgin and the damned, and the right side is the saved. We see this even mirrored within uh, ecclesiastical architecture, mm. and it moves towards all sorts of very interesting mythological ideas of we have the devil's door in churches because during the baptism you had to keep, the north door is classed as the devil's door right so the north side of the church is often seen as the sinister side where those who had committed suicide babies who had not been baptized would be born this is this is the way the theory goes and that when one would be baptized when the child was baptized you would have to have the north door open so that you could let the devil out okay problem with that is that baptism occurred in the porch so the devil would have to run through the church and out the door. <laughs> Not to mention that many churches have their north door as their primary entrance, so he's coming through the front door. Mm. But a lot of these become blocked over time, so that's where the idea comes from. But the left side is seen as the female side, the sinister side, and this is developed on and on as we go throughout the later Middle Ages. And you see it represented in like Disney cartoons with like a devil and a, what, sorry, yeah. a devil on this yeah. shoulder and an exactly. angel on the other shoulder. But the go. left side is really interesting because like, my dad always said to me, don't write with your left hand, write yeah. with your right hand. Mm. Um, and in a lot of Muslim cultures, we're told, you've got to wipe your behind with mm. your left hand, <laughs> not with your right hand. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, so and that's, that's not, that's not and just evil. Muslim, yeah. that's all over. That's, it's, it's, you know, yeah. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. I think, is, is you're not meant to, yeah. Don't, don't eat with the hand that you wipe your bottom with, everyone. 
Just so that's just common, <laughs> that's common sense. Top top facts from Histfest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, it, it is interesting that we we're getting this um, idea of the devil as um, as an actual person. Is there mm. a is there a Satan figure in Islam in the same way that there is? Is there a fallen angel or a is there a person that you Satan go, That's devil? is a fallen angel, yes. Okay. But he's so he's told to bow down to Adam, and the devil says, "No, uh, I'm better than Adam." Um, there's an interesting element, I think, which probably comes from Zoroastrianism, where okay. uh, Satan, you know, Satan's going to follow humans around till Judgment Day. I think that's more a concept of the battle between good and evil happening. Mm. Um, the devil has his little minions, so it's not just the devil. The devil's got kids running around <laughs> and following everybody, um, which is why, uh, like, for example, the concept of Ramadan right now, where people aren't eating uh, or not drinking, is the idea of limiting that desire. And actually, there's a kind of a saying that during Ramadan, the devil was locked away. Mm -hmm. once, once a month, he's locked away. Um, that's not literal. That's more... The idea that everyone's suppressing their desires. Mm. So the devil isn't a thing, it's more an emotion. Again, it's your desire, it's your impulse to eat mm. or sleep or whatever. Yeah. Um, impulse to sort of, you know, have a nice time and eat all the food and be lazy and yeah. do all the things. Yeah. I can, I can see. I think in Christianity as well, there's fasting used to be much bigger in this country. Mm. You know, you'd have Lent, Lent is yeah. the main time it would happen, and you would have special. I, I went, there was a, there was a, uh, in Cambridge recently, they had a, a, a display of all of these bowls for fasting. Mm -hmm. So it's the fasting plates and everything else. They're all made out of horrible crockery. So not only weren't you eating very much, it was out of really ugly bowls. So everything was bad about it. And you were really the sort of self-punishment, well, which you're is... You're supposed to be atoning yeah. for your sins. That's, that's yeah. the mirror yeah. of Jesus. But atoning for your sins is a bit different to avoiding temptation in the first place, mm. is it not? <gasps> I th no, I think they work hand in hand. Um, so, for example, in Islam, you have the pilgrimage, one of the five pillars. Yeah. The last one is the pilgrimage and in the Hajj. And... Um, in Mecca, there is a representation of the devil. It's a column. Mm -hmm. It's just a concrete column. And during the, you might have seen this, like, you know, people going round the, the Kaaba, which is the cube. And there it is near that cube, there's a representation of the devil. Um, it's just like a sphere of a column, really. It's nothing massive, but people throw stones at it. That's part of the ritual. Mm -hmm. And it's the idea that there, the devil tried to tempt Abraham mm. right. as he was building his shrine. So, temptation, atonement. It's very, I was thinking of pilgrimage as soon as you yeah. said that, and we have the same thing. You're atoning for your sins as you are I mean, going on, you know, peregrinating, and, and then you touch something at the end yeah. to symbolize that is done. I think people would be very shocked at how people in the Middle Ages actually, the pilgrimages they went on, and how enormous they were. I mean, they were better traveled than I am. Well, yeah, true. I'm thinking Marjorie Kemp, to be fair. Oh, well, <laughs> she, she was eternally on pilgrimage. Uh, but most people only went on the great pilgrimages, yeah. probably, they were once in a lifetime event. You, you probably would go to your local parish church to visit your local saint. But for the same reason, you know, we didn't have modern medicine. So you go for a cure or, you know, some sort of ailment. It's for the same thing. You are, you know, journeying to a place in hopes of whatever it, whatever it may be. Excellent. Well, this is, this is getting off of hell. Yes. So back to hell. Uh, so well, it isn't. Other than... <laughs> no, no, it isn't. It isn't. But th so this, this symbolises... I'm just having a look. There's, there's the hell over there look on the left, as you say. Oh, it's, it's on the right. How does that work? Hang on. What's going on here? No, we're Why they the no, 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 left. We're, we're okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, fair enough. Right. Yeah. So yes. it's stage left. So what, what we're seeing here is essentially a, a doom painting. It's the last judgment, really, for the Book of Revelation. And you would find these on the chancel arch, so between the nave and the chancel in the church. So the nave is the congregation, the populace is space. They would maintain it, take care of it, and you couldn't enter into the chancel. That's the most sacred mm. area for the clergy. So when you walked into church, you would have this huge painting, essentially in front of you, right in front of you, you walked in as a sort of great billboard, great advertisement to say, you need to live a faithful life, and this is going to happen on the day of judgment. So you need to ensure that you are ensuring that you um, fulfill and believe in Christ's sacrifice, but also atone for your sins 
But this is the day of judgment. So they, at this point, are people believing in purgatory? Yes, which is what I was, we were going back to on pilgrimage. OK. Because the concept of pur pur purgatory doesn't come in until the 12th century. So okay. it's much, much later on that it actually becomes doctrine. Um, and it's an, a way of getting around you're going one place or the other. You can you know, get rid of your sins, if you will, and move through that space. But it becomes problematic okay. because it essentially is a driver for the economic financial enterprise that underpins the Catholic Church and perhaps its corruption. Because you can buy an indulgence and essentially have atoned from your sins by just purchasing um, a piece of paper. And that's the problem. So, hence, we get to the 16th century, we get to the Reformation, and they push out purgatory. Which, mm -hmm. boo to Thomas Cromwell for that. <laughs> it would have there been. were a bit more. You can blame Luther <laughs> and everyone for this, but yeah. this is essentially this, this sort of idea here is you need to live a faithful life. And, and is there a, um, in Islam, is there a, the idea that, you know, between, you know, you dying and judgment? There's no purgatory, but there are you get a teaser of heaven or hell. So when you're buried, mm. as soon as you're buried, the angels come and visit you. And if you've led a good life, you get kind of sweet air being funneled into your grave. Mm. You have a nice, lovely sleep. And we if you've had, had a bad life, mm. you might be funneled uh, some flames. You know, just a teaser. It's not like hell, hell. You're getting <laughs> barbecued. A yeah, you're getting a bit yeah. of barbecued. Yeah. Um, right. It's not the full thing. Because in Islam, you have to be buried very quickly, don't you? Within 24 hours. Yeah. Very similar to Judaism. Yeah. Um, a lot of that has to do also, I mean, the heat as well. I mean, you think about Arabia and practical, the Middle East. Practical. Yeah. It's going to be decomposed in the 24 hours. So there's an element of that practicality. Um, but there is no purgatory. So yeah. it's heaven or hell. We're all waiting. So once you're dead, you wait for the day of judgment. Okay. Um, so purgatory seems quite complicated to the Muslim eye. But it was quite complicated anyway. <laughs> so it was fought and debated over for centuries, and still is. <laughs> it's, yes. Uh, so next one, here we have, I think well, this is, must be the circles of hell, surely. This is where we're getting into, look at you just going, no, I don't want to talk about the circles of hell. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is, it is, it's not the circles of hell. Oh, okay. So but what this is a representation of is the sort of layers of the universe. Oh, okay. place with hell at the center. So the concept of the circles of hell doesn't really exist. But Giotto painted the, his last judgment painting. Mm -hmm. And he sort of introduced this, this idea of circles of hell, layers of hell, or at least these groupings of sins and punishments and all that sort of thing. And Dante sees that, takes it on. So we think that Dante's Inferno, his Divine Comedy, was inspired by Giotto's painting. Okay. But it doesn't really exist. It does a little bit more. Easy. So the, there are seven layers of hell. The seven is symbolic mm. to mm. being infinite, um, as well as paradise. There's eight paradises, seven layers of hell. So the idea that God is more merciful than he is. Oh, that's nice. Wrath, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's nice. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like getting a supermarket voucher. You, know, oh, you okay. might get something back. It's okay. Credit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's balanced in your favour a little bit. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But no, there, there are layers in Islam, um, and there are gates as well. Yeah, we have gates. Yeah. We have gates. We've got the pearly gates, and what are the gates? Oh, the gates of hell, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, not quite the same, but we have gates. But... But with this, with the idea of this Christian hell, you have all of the, you know, it going... I remember my favourite one was the people with their heads on backwards. And I can't remember what mm. punishment that's for. You've got to walk backwards with your heads on backwards. And I think that's because you're, like, duplicitous or something mm, in life. Yeah, that, that would make sense. I like that, uh, it, it, which is it's quite, a, you know, original one. I, I quite like the different punishments. Yeah. And then you've got Satan in the centre who just eats people. And is, and is trapped there. Isn't he trapped in ice as well? I can't remember I can't, it. I honestly I think can't. he's trapped in ice. It's in very, but this is, all of this, again, is not in doctrine. This no. is all really late medieval, early Renaissance, vivid imaginations of yeah. artists. So our concept of hell today is created by literature, by artists, and now by Hollywood today. Mm. And it's become just a sort of metaphor for just living a good life or trying to live a good life in fear of what may happen next. It's interesting because Dante puts the Prophet Muhammad in yeah, his yes. layers of hell. 
charming. So, yeah, I know, what a great guy. <laughs> but like, it, it's, it's a response because when Dante's alive, the Islamic world is very powerful. Mm. It's a superpower. It's the America of its day. So th there's, there's an element of, it, it's, it's the element of poking a stick at the, the giant at that moment in time. So again, it's, it's responding to your environment. Yeah. There's, there's interesting manuscripts as well, like similar to um, what I've said about responding to the environment. Uh, in Spain, there's the forced conversions of Muslims to Christianity when the Inquisition happened. Their manuscripts have been found in southern Spain, which is very interesting because there's a language called Al Hamiado. Al Hamiado is basically Arabic script, but when you read it, it's Spanish. The reason why that is, is because a lot of the Spaniards are concealing their identity as being Muslim behind closed doors. And in those manuscripts, there are versions of hell. Now, it's quite tightly knit to the standard hell devil but they find one interesting nook, which is wine drinkers will go to hell. Ooh. And that addition is not in the Arabic scripts. And the reason why that is, is because at that period, they're being forced to eat pork and drink by the Inquisition. This is when tapas was invented, people. Tapas, tapas is racist. Is, yeah, it's That's a really very racist, mean. xenophobic thing. <laughs> those lovely prawns and tomato sauce, <laughs> oh. you can't eat those if you're Jewish or Muslim. And that's the point of the reason why the Inquisition and the Spanish people did it, is to out them out them amongst yeah. them. We did give paella, Chorizo. though. Yeah. Yeah. Paella. Oh, we gave paella. Oh, yeah. so good. Anyway. We anyway, see, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, we see similar in Christianity. Mm. Because uh, in some of the doom paintings, in fact, we have the satanic bestial figure. And next to him, there's a great one, uh, 15th century doom painting, Last Judgment, um, in St. Thomas's Church in Salisbury. And there's a little alewife right next to the little... Hooved, cloven hooved figure and she's obviously she's she's the temptress because she's bringing the ale and she's luring us into bad behavior oh. and it, it was often it was sort of a, a representation of temptation was the ale wife because that's what we you know christians were drinking yeah was ale and it was right and leading to to all sorts it's very interesting about Islam and the wine, though, because I I've, I've been reading and writing a lot about pirates and about travel and that sort of thing. But it is that thing of how Islamic um, sailors manage to get by because you know water turns to slime within two days of being at sea and how they were doing it. And for the Mediterranean, it's kind of all right because you can stop in islands and mm. get fresh water and everything else. But it was understood by a lot of people, a lot of Islamic sailors, that wine was okay. It was just the spirits that were bad. Yeah. And you could yeah. only drink certain. So it's really interesting that came out then. Yeah. Just, to, just as an aside, that made me go, oh, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, alcohol is forbidden in Islam, mm -hmm. but uh, alcohol drinkers are never specified as going to hell mm. in the theological texts. Um, a lot of Sufis drank wine. Um, so there is kind of a flexible sort of interpretation when it comes yeah. to alcohol. It's quite murky. Of course. Because yeah. <laughs> well, they're alcohol. all drunk, yeah. Exactly. Um, but it, it, it's always a response to your conditions. Mm. Mm. That's what hell is. It's a response to your, your behaviour. In response. Behaviors. Yeah. yeah. So shall I, shall I click and see what else see what we've else got we... there? What, what else have we got? Oh, look. The hell mouth. A, there you go. That's proper, isn't it? Man riding a horse inside a sort of weird crocodile devil thing. Yeah. But well, we can see how similar it is to the first Im image we were looking at mm. as well. Yeah. We have this sort of weird sea creature-y, whale-y, bear -y, I don't know, some sort of dragon-y thing. But this is the first representation that we get of hell in the early English period. So you know, 8th to 10th century, really, um, this idea of hellmouth and, you know, the souls were going into them. We don't see the sort of fiery concept for another few centuries. This is the first representation. Amazing. And that is basically lifted out of Revelation. Yes, exactly. Cool. That's, you know, pretty it's, much. it's pretty... Mass you do, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, oh. that's it. So, <laughs> we've gone through it. We can, we can stay on the hellmouth um, <laughs> for a little bit longer. How are we doing for time? Uh, where's Rebecca? We got. Should we? Should we go to some questions now, or should we? Should we? We got a bit longer. So <laughs> what we can talk about is is this concept of Satan, the devil himself, mm. and how because there seems to be different versions mm. of Satan. You you do, and I know they they all cross over and mix a bit. But you do have this idea of Satan that, as being this hellmouth monster that does literally eat and you know yeah. torment people forever. 
then you have this sort of, I would say, sort of romantic version, or at least it's, you know, Milton-inspired, mm -hmm. paradise lost, Satan battling against what he sees as the wrongs, and then basically, you know, having, you know, God and the world turn against him. And that has inspired all of these very romantic, that first image that we saw of the devil with his nipples out, that sort of very attractive, kind of like fallen angel, you know, version mm. of him. And then we also have the one that we get in Goethe and we get um, with Dr. Faustus and Faust is the sort of trickster, yeah. is somebody who's going to sneak, yeah. a bit like the alewife. Yeah. Um, are we missing any of that? Which is, um, which, do you, which do you think is, is going to last longest? We seem to have gone back, I think, yeah. to that idea, you know, you're saying about the romantic idea, which stems, I would say, from the fallen angel, so Lucifer, really, and this beautiful ethereal winged being Mm. That's what we seem to have gone back to. It's only after that um, that we get the idea of Pan, uh, the pagan god with the cloven hooves. But, you know, we're going right back to Genesis. That's, but many theologians believe that the concept of Satan actually predates Genesis, in fact. This idea... Hang on, so, in the beginning there was the word... In the beginning there was Satan. <laughs> Never before, <yeah. laughs> before the word there was Satan. The concept, at <laughs> least. Um, yeah, and then we go through and we get... Lucifer, then we get Pan, and then we move into that, you know, mouth eating, mouth eating, eating with his mouth, you know, crunching on the souls. That seems to be inspired by the imaginations of Renaissance painters. I find it too. interesting that the depiction of the devil is more or less a man. Mm. Mm, more or less. But Lilith we get yeah. in between, I suppose, which is inspired by Judaism. So yeah. the Lilith character does come in. She tends to get sort of conflated with with Lucifer, you know, as this sort of incubus versus succubus idea as well. Mm. And, you know, if anyone's watched the most recent Sabrina the Teenage Witch, oh, <laughs> but the, the main character is Lilith. Right. She is the, the female overlord. So I mean, if we're going popular culture, she's also Dr. Fraser Kane's wife is Lilith, who is... <laughs> Can we really get that? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. that's what I think of every time you say it, and I'm just like, that's unfair. But oh, if, no, okay. if you think of the character, <laughs> yeah. though, in, in the Sabrina one, she's mm. a very, you know, she's supposed to be beautiful and attractive, and she is a luring, seductress, temptress. Mm. So I think it's this idea of Satan as, as disguised, and that was the problem, I think, when we get to the, um, the witch trials, etc., that Satan was doing his bidding with women on Earth, and therefore they were Satan in disguise, yes, and still are. The way you can, sorry. No, I was going to say, I've heard some people fancied Hades from Hercules. Did, did you yeah. fancy her Hades? I, Hercules? I, I, pretty much so, anybody in TV, it's, it's very few parties. Any Disney smashes, yeah. animation. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. I mean, yeah, even Scar from Lion King. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You have, I mean, all of them. Uh, <laughs> how did this topic Skeletor. get Skeletor. <laughs> anyway, yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, what, what were we? And I see, got me all the stuff. Uh, Lucifer, Lucifer. Lucifer. I think we're moving towards the idea of a futuristic hell. Yeah. And yeah. we were talking earlier about um, the metaverse. The, the metaverse. Yeah. I hate that word. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Facebook. Just but say Facebook. <laughs> social media, Facebook, the internet, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. You know these idea of uh, the, the ideas of hell on earth, but it's not really on earth. It's another domain. It's Another still round. ticking. Those Use boxes. the word domain, that's an internet word. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> there you go, yeah. God, I'm corrupted already. <laughs> that, that, that's where we are, right? We talk about the internet as this Wild West, and maybe that's the future. Well, it's because we were saying, are we in hell? Mm. If we think of this metaverse. Well, we, we mentioned Goethe, we mentioned uh, Dr. Faustus. I mean, Metastopheles says, if you're out of God's presence, that is hell. This is that's, hell and that not is, out of it. This that's is, how it starts. Is yeah. you, you need to be in God's light. You need to accept Christ's sacrifice. If you exactly. are not, you are in the darkness. And that's, but Satan himself, he goes from the sort of light and darkness to darkness, but he actually is seen as a, a light type figure at the beginning. Mm. Yeah. And he's, oh, there we go. Is that, is that? Five minutes. Till questions, yes. Cool, excellent. Um, I do. I do think it's a very interesting idea that a, a lot of the time Satan's actually depicted as quite sympathetic as well. Mm. I don't think Mark Zuckerberg is, mm -mm. but <laughs> I think I think that the actual character, particularly the idea of the fallen angel, um, I think people gravitate to what Al Pacino's um, um, version of him as well is very 
you know, it's fun and it is also it is fun. cheeky, yeah. naughty. Cheeky and naughty. Yeah. Oh, one of the things that I, I got asked recently was where the idea of like the red suit with mm. the red cape and the red tights comes Not from. And that is directly from um, Goethe and it's Faust. Because when they did a stage production of it, he's very sneaky and he was always dressed in a red cape and red tights, which is where that image of the cheeky devil comes from. Mm. See, I think of Britney Spears. Yeah, exactly. That's Britney where Britney Sp Spears oh, right. was getting her influence. No, I was Goethe. thinking Coca-Cola with Santa. Oh, yeah, that's, that's different. That's different. That's a whole other thing. We go <laughs> when you say red suit, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's but, but I think that's a good point, because mm. the idea of hell that we have today, and Satan, has been heavily inspired by Hollywood, yeah. mm. rather than anything doctrinal. Yeah. But isn't, isn't Hollywood also inspired by the doctrinal images? But the doctrine really isn't doctrine. It's apocryphal texts. They are even far more, I suppose, cultural is the word here. They only become doctrine far later. And, and that nothing really that we're talking about, this fiery torment, is ever really Christian doctrine. No, no they're not in the central text. This is the whole point. They're all no. embellished, layer upon layer, century upon century. They become embellished. Influenced by society, yeah. changes in culture. And I, also, I, I just find it fascinating though, that it isn't just the Abra Abrahamic uh, religions which have the concept of the afterlife, have the concept of hell. If you even look at the, like, the Mayans, they had the idea of the tree, so you die at the bottom of the tree and you have to slowly ascend mm -hmm. up. You have, you know, we've already mentioned the Chinese mythology and their version where you basically stay in a room until you can work off your sins till you can get reincarnated. And that's yeah. something similar with Buddhism and Hinduism. And so, and all of these, you know, Zoroastrianism you've mentioned yeah. as well. I mean, that, I think you walk over a bridge. I seem to yeah. remember a bridge in that yeah, one. Yeah, that's in Islam as well. Yeah, yeah. it is in yeah. Really. yeah, it is. It's the bridge, and then you get turned out, and I think you end up in a house. And the favorite, my favorite punishment about that hell is the food is bad. And that's oh, actually we don't really bad, it. if you think about it, when you have to eat rotten food forever. Oh. That sounds that's like wet spoons. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're already in hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other other pubs are available. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, <laughs> Pub chains. <laughs> but what is it, do you think, about the human condition that requires us to, one, believe in an afterlife and to believe in this sort of cosmic justice? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Because we don't know. Because we don't know what happened before, we don't know what happened afterwards. And I think we all have an inherent faith and hope in something. Um, and we're clinging on to memory and nostalgia of those mm. who have gone. So it's that eternal hope that you will meet them in a beautiful, par you know, paradise, utopian space. But it's also, I mean, the concept of hell really is about ensuring you live an ethical, moral, and faithful to God type of life. That's it. It is to control behaviour. Let's yeah. let's be very honest. That's at the heart of this, and that's where it stems from. Yeah. In all religions. Really. And it's it's. I think hell is needed because essentially what it's saying is life is not happy go lucky. If you just had paradise, mm -hmm. we're dancing through grass, dancing with flowers. That's, that's not how life is. You need the duality. You need the complexity because that's what you go through life. Yeah. But you also need it to explain all the bad stuff that's happening. On it Earth. does it right. though. And the uh, the idea of justice is quite strong in Islam, social yeah. justice. Um, and in Christianity. Uh, yeah, and in Christianity yeah. as well. And I think we talk about social justice set in secular terms. You know, we look at what's happening right now in the world, you know, dictators butchering people. Like, that element of justice still rings in our DNA. Yeah, that is That's yeah, inherent, isn't it? Yeah. So we, I think we might still need hell. We're always going to need hell. Yeah. Well, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Heard we it here you. first, hell's a good thing. Uh, we all need it. So if you end up there, your own fault. Um, <laughs> so true. That is, that is, um, <laughs> that is true. Unless you get tricked, because Mephistopheles oh, okay. does trick, and I think that's really mean. But um, we're going to open this up for questions. Does anybody put your paw in the air if you have a question for us? Or so we've got a question over there. Does Sarah want to run with the microphone, the blue microphone um, of dreams? And remember, this can be... Any any bad question? <laughs> setting is setting is well. Oh, please don't. Bad <laughs> um, I was just wondering because you mentioned like some of the contemporary kind of um, representations, like in terms of like Lucifer and Sabrina the Teenage Witch. But one that really springs to mind for me is the Good Place. Yes. Um, and which I just find a really interesting exploration of like a lot of the stuff that you you've mentioned today and I was just wondering what you kind of how you felt that kind of fed into considering 
how secular the world kind of claims to be at the moment that we're still creating an entire show that explores these topics. It's so interesting. Do you want to answer that one? Um, <laughs> like that briefly explain what The Good oh, Place yes, is. Oh, yes, sorry. I haven't watched know. it. Oh, you the, should. It's good. Oh, you, you'd love it. Yeah, it's really good. So, yeah. The Good Place, it's a series on Netflix, and the premise starts, I won't ruin the whole thing for you, but the premise oh, we're starts. we're going to have to ruin it. We're going to have to ruin a bit of it, but the premise starts with the idea that um, a person ends up, you know, she basically dies, and she's there on the couch, and God, you know, the... It's St. It's St. Peter, isn't it? Basically, I think, yeah, that sort of yeah, is his yeah, character. Yeah. St. Peter sort of saying to her, yeah. "It's all right. You ended up in the good place." And she's like, "Oh, brilliant!" But it turns out that everybody That's around her is like saints, and she's a really horrible person. <laughs> and she's having to disguise the fact that she's in this good place. And then further revelations get revealed about what happens to her. And actually, is this a form of torture? And is she actually in the bad place? And it's her trying to work out where she is. So. That's uh, the point. What do you think? What do you think about this? Well, I think that goes back to what we were talking about is are we in hell? Yeah. Sorry, for, might have given it away. <laughs> <laughs> I could still watch it, it's very good. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a really good question. And this move towards um, secularism or the secularization of society, um, I use the, the term secular like this because in, in, the, in the Christian church, secular also means something different. But. The f I think that's the point, though, is we've said all the way through that this isn't part of, th of doctrine. Mm. This was the concept of hell, even the concept really of Satan as we know it, has been influenced by culture, by behaviour, by changes in society, responses to crisis, death, mm. all, the ba all the bad things in the bad place. So I think that's why it's become so ingrained in society and we need it because we need it to, as a sort of conclusion uh, and a response to the good things. Yeah. It's the only sort of opposite. I think we've gone full circle because yeah, um, that's the point. Yeah. hell starts in earth, on earth, sorry. And I think we've gone from that starting point to it being otherworldly, both in Christianity and Islam, and now we've come into the secular mode for... and it's back on earth. I think it's now just become a metaphor for purification um, and doing good. You know, and we use it in everyday speech, you know, God, that was hell. Yeah, oh. or bet the devil you know. But yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it is literally ingrained in our <laughs> language and our culture, but it's not really exactly come from doctrine. No. Also, if you like The Good Place, you'd really like a Radio 4 series from the 90s called Old Harry's Game, which is wonderful, because that's a guy going down to hell, and he's actually in hell, but because he's atheist, he doesn't believe it and just thinks this is brain sparking while he's in a coma, and but it's it, really fun. But that's the point, is it's so com this is so complicated, and it's gone from one side to the other, and it's, it's a place, then it's not, it's just a realm. We still don't know. It goes back and forth and back and forth, and I think that's why we're still so fascinated by it, because we just don't know. And we will never know, or we will know. Or we might be awful. do. <laughs> Wait till the day of judgment. Yes, so Sarah got the mic. There she comes. Sorry, were you up with somebody there who was asking a question? No, no. no. Okay. Easy. There we go. No, that's good. <laughs> We're going down the steps this time, so. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, the sort of, first of all, in terms of hell, like, I remember, I'm not sure if this was from a. Um, uh, the Quranic text, or more likely, probably a hadith, a prophetic tradition, that um, hell will talk at some point, or rather will sp speak in heavy yeah. speech, quotation, it's God. And I wonder if, in overall, in, in Christianity as well as Islam, um, how much precedent there is for it as an entity and as not necessarily evil in and of itself, as and as a basically a practical sort of tool really more than anything else and hell is actually like everything else in the world that isn't humans or or other uh salient sentient beings that are, have free will is like everything else it's basically just subservient to god mm. um and on the back of that similarly um because like i know that like in the good place they talk about it, it's literally a place mm -hmm. um and it, it it's just the, it's just the ground, and it's only because of everyone that's in it, and and that's really really starkly different from a lot of other sort of depictions, um, especially like for example when you think about 
the good place as a point system, which is very similar to um, Islamic and uh, I think sometimes Christian yeah. depictions of the book where it's like someone uh, angels are writing down your deeds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wonder so how much how much precedent there is for uh, really the sentience of hell. Uh, and it's not just a place, but actually like a spiritual sort of entity. Um, and yeah, and off the back of that about Satan, whether because um, like some in Islam, some people say, you know, there's big debate if you see an angel is here, jinn, because some people say the angels are actually incapable of dis- disobeying God, and actually, you know, like um, is he is he merely a cog in the like I was reading a really interesting Jewish thing about how he's actually a servant of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So he, is he doing God's will? Yeah. yeah. The, the Sufis actually have, uh, that's that last point you make. Um, the Sufis believe that he is an evil. He's actually doing God's work mm. um, because they take an esoteric form, uh, meaning to, to, to the devil. Um, what the interesting, whether he's an angel or jinn. So jinn is a spirit. It's, they're made from smoke. Uh, or fire. Mm. Um, they're a bit like humans. They have families, kids. They do good and bad, whatever. But humans can't see them. They live in another kind of. They live on Earth, but you can't see them. So the idea of the devil isn't an angel, but he's similar to humanity. A spirit lends itself more to the secular version of the devil, and that uh, the devil, you know, has free will in a way he's kind of yeah. he's a he's a servant of god um and what you talked about the hell being an entity in itself speaking that's a really interesting point and that i don't know does christianity have hell talking not in the book not in the actual bible not that but I, in commentaries not that i'm aware of yeah that i can think of but it's similar to you i mean the the devil is starts as a sort of angelic creature, uh, angelic being, should I say. Um, but as I've said earlier, he, he's an adversary to God. He is the fallen angel. It's only later on where I think he kind of gets annoyed and he, he thinks, well, stuff this. I want to be the great omnipotent being and the gloves come off. Um, but the, the concept of it being um, not a place as well, it, it sort of goes back and forth. But you do have the idea of, like, in Christianity, that you need the Antichrist and you need all these things to happen in order to bring about revelation and have, you know, heaven on earth. Kind of, yeah. So in that sense, is this not just part of God's plan anyway? And so, But this is what we started yeah. with. It's just all <laughs> predestined. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. This, this is, is the big debate. Oh, we go, we've, got got we, we've, got to, we've got to ask you, Rebecca, what's... I'm getting more cheeky as the days progress. I've asked a question in every panel. But I know I know it's outside of your immediate expertise, but I just wondered what your thoughts are as a panel on the rise of um, things like Satanism in the 20th century, where people actually go, uh, they actually take the devil as their, I don't know what the word is, but they, they worship him. So I just find it really interesting and what that means. Mm. <laughs> I think that goes Devil against... <laughs> I don't want to touch this one. Well, yeah, um, squeaky that. Into the Devil a Daughter, which one of Christopher Lee's amazing films. I can no. <laughs> I think it stems from uh, a a curiosity, uh, which hence why we're, we're here and talking about this. But also the fact that perhaps uh, following a certain faith or a Christian life or whatever it might be has not panned out the way they thought or they don't accept because of the travesties and crises of the world, they look to another being, and which is seen as the opposite. And I think that's... Oh, I could be convinced. Well, it's what wrong, Marlowe sets out at the beginning of Dr. Faustus. Is Dr. Faustus is an amazing scholar. Does he become a doctor and help people through medicine? Well, what's the point? Everybody's going to die. Does he go off and discover physics? Well, what's the point? Because I'm going to die anyway, and so all of my knowledge will be lost, and does it really matter anyway because everybody dies? May as well, so my souls of the devil have a really good time, and yeah. I probably won't go to hell anyway because I don't believe in it, even though the devil's right there and he's a bit of an idiot. But that's... <laughs> <laughs> Resigning yourself to what you think may occur anyway. Yeah. So let's have fun in the meantime. Well, it's, it's short termism, I believe, um, is I, devil I, worship. It, I, I can't really see it being the idea of believing in 
the eternal immortal soul. No. Well, perhaps they do. I don't know. I haven't read the Satanic Bible. I mean, we well, the Satanic Bible is all about just living for now. Um, well, is it, that's, that's the point, isn't yeah. it? It's not, it? It's not really about what comes next. It's let's live for the day. Yeah. Mm. Um, because it's all, I suppose, because we have a predestined fate. Well, yeah, but no, not, not even we have a predestined fate. It's literally, it's well, more like atheism in the sense that it is, it's that's not it. really, I mean, if the Satanic Bible is just a, a, a thing of being cheeky and just pointing out the, the silly bits in Christianity and then, you know, just saying, let's all have sex, it's fun. <laughs> So <laughs> they do that in the Bible too. They do do that in the Bible, but it's much more prescriptive, to be fair. In certain Old ways. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yes, but, but, there, but yeah. there are ancient. I mean, Satanism might be quite new, but there are ancient traditions of the elements fire. Mm. Rather than we're talking about hell and Satan, oh, yeah. but the fire is celebrated in, in and of yeah. itself. Yeah, the yeah. element. So it's like the well, hellfire caves I was talking about earlier. Yeah, it's yeah. Kind of well, I mean, if you're going to pick a, a god to worship, I mean, the, you know, the Jews picked a god to worship because there's loads of gods. Hence, worship no other gods before me because there mm. are other gods. Remember, there is a pantheon before there is the monotheism, and then you've got the sort of weird thing where. If there are other gods, why not see if any of the others are any good? Well, we? that's the point, you isn't know. it? It's yes. try before you buy. Yeah, yeah, spread your bets out. <laughs> oh, hedge your bets. <laughs> yeah, please. sorry, hedge, yeah. Um, I, I should read, I feel like we're, we're letting yeah. um, buy um, people online. So, um, how this, I thought this was really interesting. I'm not sure if um, either of you know the answer to this question, but it's um, um, by, I, and I picked one whose name I can't pronounce, but I think it's more a, but that's probably, I think it's an Irish name, and I apologise. Um, but um, how is the portrayal of hell used as part of, sometimes forced, conversion to Christianity in colonialism? Do they find ways of relating it to the indigenous belief systems of the people? Do we know about this? Not a clue. We don't know about this, unfortunately. <laughs> if but anybody I in case does. They did, it was a really cool question. It's a so, good question. Yeah. Because there is, there is a lot of, you know, if you go to parts of, um, I'm thinking, where am I thinking? I'm thinking of Lilungwe and stuff. There, there are places where, and in um, uh, Malawi. Um, there are places where, you know, certain tribal dances have been banned because they look like satanic worship and that sort of thing. And then they brilliantly intertwine Christianity and stories into that. So it looks kind of Christian. Yeah. And I think we've done that as well with like a mummy, mumming plays and that sort yeah, of thing mumming, as well. Yeah, mumming plays, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it probably does descend from Christianity, a lot of that idea. And there, I can't think of like where it is or what it is, but tribes that sort of dress up a little bit devilishly with the mm. horns and things. So all these ideas, you know, have their, have their legs in what we're talking about today. Um, but the forced nature, I wouldn't like to. No, no, but... I, I can give it to you. I think religion and colonialism kind of, yeah. they go hand of in course. hand, don't they? It's how you kind of justify ripping off loads of people and saying, well, we're saving their souls. So well, this is the concept of purgatory and why it was sort of yeah. gotten rid of. Um, no. And you look at the Caribbean and you know, Christianity is still very much alive there. Yeah. But obviously, it's, it's an import. Yeah. So it's for, well, I suppose it is forcing and controlling behaviour. Mm. And we're going right back to the beginning yeah. again. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I saw some hands up over there, so we, we should we should go 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 at the back. Oh yeah. There we go. Hello. Slightly less academic question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would just want to know if anyone can confirm whether this is true or not. I read it online, and you know the picture of the statue on the first slide. Apparently, the Pope commissioned someone to make a statue, uh, and then I'm paraphrasing here, um, but the Pope says, "Why is he hot?" Uh, and gets them to redo it or commission someone else. I just want to know if that's true or not, or if the internet like lied to me. <laughs> is, is this is this from the Le Genie du Mal? Is that the name of it? Yeah. Uh, and the answer to that is, I believe that is true. Mm, However, he was just slightly too sexy uh, in this statue, which you can really understand because. <laughs> Wow. Uh, like I, I put this down to the influence of Milton. I think this is a Paradise Lost version yeah. of of, uh, of of Devil. It's like this really traumatic Batman character who just like, oh my God, guys, like my dad's really bad, you know. <laughs> and so he's he's very he's very traumatized and it's a little bit everything like else. Story and Grey reminds me of as well, and yeah. Narcissus mm -hmm. and that idea too, which I suppose is inherent within all of this. But, you know, while he does look good, he has got massive bat wings, which is not so hot when you think about it. Yeah, you just 
pretend they're not there. We've probably got time for another quick question. One question, So, yeah. um, so pick, pick somebody near you. Go on. There we go. We'll have a man. There we go. Um, just a question regarding the uh, dragons in the Persian manuscript that you showed. Um, because China has, between Buddhism and sort of folk religion, a lot of very interesting I ideas of it and, and visions of its own hell and the various spirits and levels that it entails. And so I was wondering if there was a significant degree of influence or crossover between sort of Taoist, Buddhist uh, ideas of um, of an afterlife into sort of Persia and uh, Islamic ideas of hell. Not necessarily of the afterlife. I think those are core concepts that come from the Middle East in from Christianity and Judaism. But there are influences uh, from the Far East, not just the dragons. I think it's more visual uh, influence because Islam forbids images. It forbids, um, you know, any sort of worship or visual icons. But this is kind of a loophole that the Persians do. And also remember, the Persians are mostly Shia Muslims, and they they're okay with images. So they import this, whereas you won't get that in any, in other, any other part of the Islamic world. Um, there are influences um, in terms of like Sufism and the veneration of saints. Mm -hmm. That also comes, you see that in a lot of like the Bengal region, uh, like Myanmar, comes from Buddhism as well. But in terms of the afterlife, it doesn't seep that deep. I think Christianity kind of took that influence far too early. Excellent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, do we have enough time for one question off the internet? Or do you think... OK, very quick one off the internet. Here we go. Um, what do you think um, the conception of the devil seems to vary between being a trickster in a lot of cultures or personification of evil in other cultures? So what is that? Why do we have this kind of trickster or the personification? I think we get both in we, everything. Mm. I think we do get both. It goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and now we just have it all. Um, and uh, then finally, this from Melinda. Um, is there any history of mutual critique of Islamic and Christian concepts of hell, or do they coexist slash feel pretty comfortable as parallel interpretations? What do we think? Islamic scholars don't critique Christian ideas no. of hell, and I nor do I, don't, I think no, the Christians really. do for Islam. It's kind of this sort of thing where you guys are just like, let's just not talk about each other. No, we focus detail. on ourselves. But what's it's interesting... It's like, are things the important <laughs> way? It's well, true. true. But also, like, what's interesting is that you have the wars in the Middle East, and yet at the same true. time, there's incredible scholarship. You do get it then. That's you true. have it then. But otherwise, you have, you know, in Spain, in the Middle East, you have Christian and Islamic scholars working together on the same table in Sicily as well. well so I mean, we do have see the fighting over, I was just thinking in the Hagia Sophia, Constantinople, yeah. all that era, and they're taking down and sort of mocking one another's religion. Mm. And, and the devil does come into that and yeah. the idea of hell, but not, not really critiquing and no. in a more educational and scholarly sense. I mean, Christian. You know, Muslims and Christians have rubbed shoulders for a long time. Oh, I, yes. My favourite, I, I recently read a thing about, um, it would be 14th century Venice, and you could tell what boat is coming into trade, because Venice obviously a big hub, big market hub. You could tell which boat is coming in, who owns it, because if it was rowed by Christians, it was a Muslim boat, and if it was rowed by Muslims, it was a Christian boat, which I think is a really, you know, because, you know, they, we were all slaves, it was fine. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think that wraps up um, this wonderful, you know, hopefully nobody here will find out that hell is real. So I hope that for all of you. Um, if not, sorry, you were warned. Um, <laughs> were. Uh, so a massive thank you to everybody um, in the room. A massive thank you to everybody watching over there. And a massive thank you to our two panellists, um, who is Emma and Safi. And I've been Izzy, and this has been Histfest. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.